more positive note. Not 2008, this year, it is also a good year for languages, at least symbolically. As many of you know, 2008 is the International Year of Languages, and it is, it is also the European Year for Intercultural Dialogue. In Europe, there have been many developments back in recent years linked to language rights and the protection of languages, which I'll just mention a little bit more. Um, for example, it, the European Union in 2007 got its first European Commissioner for Multilingualism, who is responsible for language policy of the European Union, such as promote the promotion of multilingualism for the citizens and institutions of the EU. From about the 1970s, the European Par Parliament has also adopted quite a few resolutions where it called for further action and commitments towards greater respect for and protection of linguistic and cultural diversity. We have many of those on the, behind me on the overhead. So this is all very impressive once again, but keep in mind that these kinds of resolutions are not legally binding. They're not part of international law. They're not part of European law as such. They're important. They're symbolic. They're, they're real, but they're not the law. I am, by background, someone with a, I have a legal background, so you'll have to forgive me if I always refer to the law. The law is important. It's <laughs> often necessary, but I would never say that it is sufficient in many cases. <coughs> in a special category, which at times has been persuasive, persuasive for governments, are a rather unique set of documents prepared by some of the world's leading experts at the request of the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, High Commissioner on National Minorities. These, by the way, these documents, they're called recommendations. They're quite detailed, and they're supposed to reflect best practice, or good practice, in the area of minorities and language rights. Um, one thing that is significant here is that those recommendations, those documents, have actually been adopted as part of mechanisms or approaches which most governments of the OSCE recognize as necessary to ensure peace and stability in a number of European countries. In other words, those recommendations are supposed to be there to help governments avoid conflicts and problems with their minorities. How to ensure peace where you have large national minorities, linguistic minorities, among others. And among those, some of those good practices are language rights for language for uh, linguistic minorities. And language rights, which I'll try to explain a little bit further on, um, they all tend to agree. There are some basic approaches which, even though we have many different kind of documents <coughs> present, they seem to speak, for want of a better same language. They agree on the basic approaches to be used. In terms of other non-legal, non-legally binding documents, at the international level, well, we have a certain number of declarations coming from the United Nations and UNESCO, uh, which I identify here. Among others, there's the UN Declaration on the, on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and the UN Declaration on the Rights of National or ethnic, religious, or linguistic minorities. There are a few other declarations, but the thing to remember once again is that these, even though they seem very impressive, important, whatever you want, they're not part of international law. They don't create any rights from a legal point of view. They use the word rights, but these are UN declarations. They are important political documents, they are important moral and even symbolic, but they're not the law. And this is sometimes something that many people tend to forget. There are even private initiatives or civil society initiatives in relation to language rights that I should mention. Now these are like private documents really, but they still come from segments of civil society and in some ways they might be 
uh, useful uh, in terms of identifying perhaps approaches that are practical. Uh, I think the first one may interest some of you, the Beijing also recommendation on the protection of the rights of linguistic minorities. It's a very, very recent development. <laughs> Hasn't even been published yet widely, but they, it will be available soon. All that I've shown to this point, none of what I've shown at this point provide for language rights in a legal sense. So, because in terms of international law, you need to look at treaties. A treaty is a legally binding document. It is law at the international level. And here, we have a lot less to work with. But when we talk about language rights in international law, what do we have? Well, at least in Europe, you do have a number of treaties. These form part of European law, or Council of Europe uh, law, at the very least. And they do create, or they give some guidance in terms of what do we mean by language rights? How does it work? What exactly does it mean in practice? So those two documents, the first one is also quite detailed, does give you some very good guidance as to what, at least in terms of your, the Council of Europe, and in Europe, uh, how language rights could work in a legal sense. Oh, by the way, why do we have two different treaties in Europe? Well, because the approach of those two documents is quite different. The first one, the European Charter for Regional or Minority Languages, actually is there to try to protect languages themselves. That's really the goal, or the official, officially stated goal of that treaty. The second treaty actually has a human rights approach. It doesn't actually protect languages because of languages or languages as such. It protects the rights of individuals who speak, among others, who speak different languages. So the focus in the second document are, is a human right individualistic approach. And in theory, the first uh, treaty in Europe is supposed to look at languages and what could we do to protect, legally speaking, uh, protect and promote languages themselves. That's why there, there we have two different legal documents. Because the focus or the approach is, in fact, completely different. Even though, and this is perhaps something, once again, most people don't realize, when you look at how the legal measures are, are written in order to recognize various rights here, they're quite similar. They actually don't guarantee that every language will be used by everyone everywhere all the time. They have a very different, very similar approach that I will describe later on as an approach of proportionality in relation to the use of a language by, by government. That's, that's the European level. At the international level, what do we have? Well, we do have some things to work with, but it's not as clear or uh, defined as in Europe. There are a few international treaties that protect cultural diversity. And, in, and a few provisions, a few sections of these two treaties that I have uh, behind me that do touch on language in some way or another, but very frankly, they're extremely weak. And in fact, I would say for, for most languages around the world, there's nothing really you can do using those two treaties. To be very frank, very blunt. Um, they're rather, I would say, disappointing, quite frankly. So if you want to refer to those documents, and ask, or if you were to ask me, can we use these treaties in international law to assist most minority languages or to assist the Tibetan language in China? No, you can't. No, there's nothing there. And that's about it. Well, there's, there are a few other possibilities of using international law to have or to have certain language rights. But you have to start looking at human rights. So international treaties, international laws that deals with human beings, not language itself, but human beings, individuals, and their language. 